So in 2018, more legislation was introduced, uh, allegedly on the uh, basis of countering terrorism and giving uh, more uh, power to law enforcement agencies and national security agencies to require software companies to provide assistance in uh, providing access to communications and other data of their users. So this was the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment, so that was abbreviated to TOLA, and it's the Assistance and Access Act of 20, 000, 2018. So this amends a whole variety of different acts, and it allows various national intelligence agencies to require a designated communications provider to make changes to their products or provide technical assistance to allow these agencies to intercept and read communications or take other actions. So this means that they could potentially go to Microsoft and say, we want you to make a change to your email client to Microsoft Outlook or to Microsoft Exchange and allow us to essentially break uh, encryption and uh, essentially look at the communication between these particular people. Uh, now, the whole argument at the time was, uh, you know, that this would potentially introduce system, um, systematic weaknesses in those products that other people could then exploit. And so various amendments have been brought in to try and firm that up, but it's still a fairly contentious laws. So the designated communications providers is a very broad term encompassing telecommunications companies, ISPs, hardware and software companies, and even companies that then supplied those companies. So there's the various request types, uh, technical assistance notices, um, technical capability and technical assistance requests. Um, and so they have various conditions that apply to these. So any company with employees in Australia could theoretically be subject to this requirement. Um, they can't introduce systemic weaknesses. Um, however, that's debatable. And the Australian government has claimed that there is oversight through independent scrutiny by the Commonwealth Ombudsman and Inspector General of Intelligence and Security um, re hearing complaints. Remember that all of these things are essentially done in secret. There's transparency reporting by companies who have received a notice to assist, although that's actually not necessarily um, true. Independent review of new capabilities by technical expert and retired judge, a judicial review of any requirements and annual reports uh, on the use of their powers. So in 2020, there was a review by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, and there was a recommendation that an independent committee oversee the issuing of requests and notices and decide whether the technical demands constitute a systemic weakness. Australian companies like Atlassian have testated that law con continues to undermine confidence in the security of the Australian technology and the perception that technologies produced in Australia will be inferior as a result. Uh, we don't know um, whether companies have been um, actually uh, subjected to specific assistance requests um, or other notices. It's also worth pointing out that companies could be assisting governments um, without these laws and the public would not necessarily be aware of this. There's other legislation, as we've covered, that gives the government powers to do various things um, that didn't require these laws. It's thought that Australia is very keen to introduce these laws in part on the request of the Americans um, because it would be too hard for the Americans themselves to introduce this legislation, if not impossible. And so by doing it in other countries that the Americans have influence over, they can still get an international network that can help them with law enforcement. So another act related to critical infrastructure and this act defines the holding of a register of critical infrastructure assets in Australia, so what is determined to be critical infrastructure. It allows the minister in charge of this to require these critical infrastructure entities um, to do certain things in the event of security risks and require that the entities provide information that is requested and allows the undertaking of risk assessments um, for these infrastructure assets. A further bill um, was brought before Parliament. Um, it's not an act as such yet, 
Um, but this extends the numbers of types of entities that constitute critical infrastructure, including universities, um, requires that they um, have cybersecurity incident notifications. Uh, that's not a bad thing, um, necessarily. Uh, enhanced cybersecurity obligations, including undertaking cybersecurity exercises. And more controversially, the CI entity may be required to install software that transmits information to the signals directorate. And so universities, for example, might have to install software on their network that the ASD can access at any time. Uh, it's fair to say that, you know, in part, these things introduce best practice, and it's quite clear that universities, as well as these other in, um, entities, should be doing this anyway. Um, some of the other things are a little bit more contentious. The universities would argue that the burdens that are placed in terms of conforming with these this legislation would be costly and time-consuming. So another act um, area of law um, relates to cyber safety. And so this is concerned with the safety of children online, so that protecting children as, uh, when they're online, uh, protecting them against cyber bullying and dealing with that, and dealing with revenge porn and other attacks on women, and to a lesser extent, uh, men. Um, so there was the Online Safety Act of 2015 um, and that involved uh, covering uh, revenge porn or non-consensual sharing of intimate images and established an e-safety commissioner. Uh, the commissioner administers complaints regarding cyberbullying and the non-consensual sharing of intimate images, coordinates departments regarding online safety for children, uh, issues requests to social media and others to take down posts related to cyberbullying and the intimate images, um, and may issue civil penalties to prevent people posting cyberbullying or intimate images online. Privacy is covered in Australia by the Privacy Act and in one of the National Security Legislation Monitor reports, uh, James Renrick said, although Australia has enacted a Privacy Act, neither the Australian Constitution nor the Common Law of Australia recognises a specific right to privacy. Instead, the Common Law mainly protects privacy through the requirement that, absent consent, there must be a legal basis for interference with personal property. So, in other words, we do not really have um, strong privacy legislation, um, and that has been the uh, source of activity on a number of different areas to try and strengthen those laws. So the Privacy Act specifies 13 Australian privacy principles which detail the principles that the entities governed, uh, covered by this Act should implement. So it's not saying must implement, it's actually just a recommendation. It covers the handling of personal information and also sensitive information. So it defines sensitive information as any information that relates to race, ethnicity, political opinions, religion, sexual orientation, health information, genetics, biochemistry, biometrics, and criminal record. The privacy prim principles include open and transparent management of personal information, anonymity and pseudonymity, so providing people with um, the ability to have anonymity and pseudonymity. So pseudonymity means that we can find out who somebody is, um, but for the most part they have a pseudonym, a bit like Discord users um, are not truly as anonymous. If I want, we can go to Discord and ask who a user is, um, if they're, or law enforcement certainly can. Notification of what information is collected and what use it will be put to obtain consent for marketing, ensure the quality of data collected, so that's integrity, uh, provide access to information and correction of errors, again, to integrity for individuals, and provide security of that information, so confidentiality um, and availability. So the penalties for breaching the Privacy Act are up to 1.8 million. Um, it is worth bearing in mind that the fines are usually in nowhere near this sort of magnitude and also 1.8 million to a, a company like Google, for example, uh, represents the revenue of a tiny, tiny fraction of a second worth of their business. 
Um, so it's inconsequential. Um, there is mandatory breach notification to the Australian Information Con Commissioner. Uh, the employee information is exempt from this act. So uh, employees can collect information about um, their, and employers can collect information about their employee um, and that is exempt. And entities exclude small businesses, universities and state authorities. So even though some um, uh, universities may say that they follow the privacy principles, they're not actually covered by them. Europe um, actually led the way in very strong uh, privacy protection. Um, now there is a sort of interchange between data protection and privacy protection. They're slightly different, but um, and this relates to data protection, but it does really sort of give you privacy protection as well. And that was introduced in 2018 by the European Union. And as I said, it's the gold standard for data protection and various US states and other countries have enacted laws that are based on the GDPR. It applies to all organisations collecting data from any European citizen, whether they are based in Europe or not. So essentially the whole world was forced to implement um, GDPR because uh, it was too hard to have systems that would operate differently when in Europe um, or dealing with European um, citizens. So the law, the, the regulation um, details that uh, companies must obtain consent to collect information. Uh, they, they have to report breach uh, notifications. They have to provide users with access to their data. They have to provide the right to be forgotten, which means that if somebody wants their data deleted for any reason, they have to remove that data. They have to provide data portability, which is to provide data in a format that could be migrated to another service. Um, they have to do privacy by design and they have to have data protection officers. Now the penalties in this are up to 4% of global revenue and that's where uh, companies, uh, even the big ones like Facebook, Google, Apple, um, start paying attention um, because it's a lot of money. The Tallinn Manual uh, concerns itself with uh, looking at international law that relates to two things. The grounds for going to a cyber war in the first place and how that cyber war should be conducted uh, once you've gone to war. So the legal terms are just ad bellum, um, so the grounds for going to cyber war and just in bello um, how this cyber war should be conducted. And this was actually uh, written by a panel of independent experts. So the first part of it concerns itself about sovereignty. Um, it establishes a threshold of injury, death or destruction when a state has the right to defend itself and states that counterforce needs to be proportional in scale and effect. There's a problem here when you judge um, necessity, uh, intent, damage and proportionality and we'll see in the case study next um, whether this was followed or not um, but it's important to realize that the manual was never supposed to be prescriptive as in actually mandating what countries should do and how they should do it it was just a uh, essentially a review of international laws and coming up with best practice as it were so in 2019 um, during a period of conflict between the palestinian group hamas and israel um, Israel claimed that they had come under cyber attack that would have harmed the quality of life of Israeli citizens. Uh, they responded um, by uh, not cyber attacks themselves, but kinetically by blowing up the building um, that they claimed was being used by Hamas's cyber operations group. Uh, it wasn't known whether there had been any casualties or deaths as a result of this. Um, and the legal legitimacy and cons consequences of the action have been strongly debated. Since there was armed conflict at the time, there was an ongoing dis um, you know, armed dispute between um, Hamas and uh, uh, Israel. So attacking a site was, with enemy combatants in was likely to have been legitimate. Um, however, um, the issue surrounding the politics of drawing connections between a cyber attack and a kinetic response um, was still being debated. 
So there are a variety of different laws that then also cover um, matters relating to cybersecurity, and they include the SPAM Act, Do Not Call Register Act, um, Health Records and Information Privacy Act in New South Wales, um, Health Records Act in Victoria, and um, Health Records Act of the ACT, and also some acts that relate to surveillance in various states. So this is a sort of other acts. Um, there's the Interception and Access Act, Telecommunications Act. Um, there's ones that actually talk about the Secret Services, uh, so the Security Intelligence Organization Act of 1979 and the Intelligence Services Act of 2001.